to thank you all for coming to my talk on ZOQ. I'm really delighted to be here in Gdansk, and I want to thank the organizers, wonderful, hardworking organizers, as I'm sure you've seen. If you've been to the workshops or the after party or the event today, everything is really put together really nicely. And it's a great privilege for me to be here today, see a new city in Poland, which I love. I'm apparently here all the time. I'm here every couple months, so I must really love Poland. And in, in fact, I do. So it's good to be back here. It's good to spend some more time in Poland and, and see some new places, have some new adventures. Today I'm going to be talking about cues, specifically asynchronous cues. But of course, that's not really what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about functional programming. Of course, <laughs> that's all I talk about. I'm going to be talking about the power of functional programming to change the way that you write software. And I'm not going to preach. I'm not going to say, hey, you should do functional programming because it's pure. Or you should do it because it comes from category theory. You should do it for all these other reasons. I'm going to say, you should do functional programming because it will give you abilities that you do not get from any other style of programming. It's going to help you solve the real world problems that you have every day in your work. And it's going to help you solve them more easily with more confidence. And we're going to take a look at that inside the domain of queues, specifically a type of queue in Zio. So what I want to do today is introduce Zio, because this queue is a component of the Zio open source library. I'll talk a little bit about Zio, just enough to sort of give you enough background that you can understand the type signatures that you're going to see in some of the coding snippets that I'll use. And I'll talk about queues in case it's been many years since CompSci 202. Then I'll introduce some of the challenges that result from building queues and using queues inside applications. And then I'll give you some examples of libraries that you already use that are actually built on queues and could not function without queues. So even if you don't use queues directly, local queues, then you definitely use a library that depends on them for providing all the functionality that you benefit from. I'll follow that up with some brief discussion about some of the trouble that results from today's queues. There are some real drawbacks to using some of the most popular queues on the JVM. And these drawbacks don't have clear solutions. They don't have clear solutions because they're written in procedural programming which doesn't offer the rich compositionality of functional programming. And if we take that concept of a queue and we port it into the world of pure FP, then suddenly we gain a world of benefits, practical benefits that have nothing to do directly with category theory or purity or any of that stuff, but practical benefits that help you solve problems that you have when you're dealing with queuing structures. I'll introduce ZLQ. I'll introduce the API, and I'll teach you how to use it. So you can go out there and hopefully build a little queuing application in not too much time at all. I'll also show you a few toyish examples of using queues inside your own applications, just to show you how simple it can be. And then finally, we'll wrap up at the end. And probably I'm going to have to go really fast because of the technical glitches there at the beginning. What is Zio? Well, Zio is a relatively new open source library. It hasn't even hit 1.0 yet. But it's got a, a bunch of people using it in production. What it does is it helps you build high performance, type safe, concurrent, asynchronous applications that don't leak resources. They don't leak threads, they don't leak memory, they don't leak sockets, they don't leak file handles. They don't deadlock, and they're easy to reason about compositionality. So you can reason about the pieces, and if you can understand the correctness of the individual pieces, then like Runar said this morning, you can understand the correctness of the whole. And this gives you a tremendous ability to build large-scale software that actually has guarantees that you can count on in your business. And with this benefit of being easier to reason about compositionality, you, you gain an ability to test the code more easily. 
and to refactor it, to make changes without breaking stuff. So you can make sure it's correct when you build it the first time and make sure it stays correct over time as people are in there making changes and enhancements to the program as a result of changing business requirements. Well, if you want to learn more about ZL, then I encourage you to hop on over to GitHub, ScalaZ slash ScalaZ ZO, and we have a repository there with the code. We have a microsite with pretty good, but could use some <laughs> improvements in the documentation. And there's enough documentation there to get you started. There are also releases on Sonotype, so you can add this to your project in a matter of seconds and start using it right away. And it is ready, ready to go. Even though it's not yet 1.0, the API is a little unstable around the edges, but companies are using this in production. So what, what's the main central idea in Zio? It's the idea of taking effects, which are something that we all have to deal with, there's nothing bad about effects. We all have to call APIs, and we have to interact with databases, and we have to do logging. We have to do inter interact with uh, caches and databases and all the other stuff that powers our business application. These are all effects, and there's nothing wrong with them. We have to do them. But it turns out that the way effects are modeled in most programming languages is actually second class. And what I mean by that is, it, effects are different than all the other stuff inside your programming language. And because they're different, you can't use the same types of machinery that you're very good at and very accomplished at and is very, very powerful to solve the problems that you encounter when you're dealing with duplication in your code base and trying to create well-structured, well-factored, correct code. If you're using Scala as a better Java, or if you're using Java, then all your effects are second class. You have a bunch of statements, and you stick these statements inside of curly braces. And there is no such thing as an entity in Scala, a value that is a hunk of statements. It's not like you can take statements and pass them around to other functions. It's not like you can store them in data structures. It's not like you can write combinators that take chunks of effectful statements and modify them in some way and return other chunks of effectful statements. That's not possible. And it's not possible because effects in Scala and Java, when you're not doing FP, are second-class citizens. And using effects in this way deprives you of all the power, all the wonderful machinery that you're very good at using at the value level. You have no ability to pass these statements to functions, return them from functions, store them in data structures, mixing different styles of programming like async and sync and concurrency. You have to do those in totally different ways. There's no unified way of doing that. You use try, catch, finally to deal with errors in your synchronous code and your statements. And then you have to use something totally different if you're dealing with errors in a concurrent scenario or asynchronous code with callbacks or futures or whatever. These are totally different mechanisms of dealing with errors. And the one thing you do get from second class effects in the synchronous context is try catch finally. And that finally lets you make sure that you build applications that don't leak resources because you can always clean up after something catastrophic happens. First class effects, on the other hand, take this notion of a bunch of statements and they say, well, what if these statements were values? And they move them over into the world of values. And when you take effects and you turn them into values, then you gain an enormous amount of flexibility and power. You can suddenly, you can take your bunch of statements, your programs, and you can pass them to functions. You can pass programs to functions. And you can return programs from functions. And if you can pass and return programs, bunches of effectful statements, you can write combinators that act on programs, just like you've seen parser combinators and some of the compositionality and streams that Runar talked about and demonstrated. You can build the same sorts of combinators to remove any type of duplication in dealing with your effectful programs. It's enormously powerful. You can solve very complex problems in a small amount of code without repeating yourself. And then you have a way to abstract over asynchronous, synchronous, and concurrent effects that lets you write unified code that doesn't have to care, really, what the implementation details are. 
these things running in different threads or are they running asynchronously or synchronously, you don't have to worry about those low-level details and your code is going to look the same regardless, which, gives, which frees you to focus on the domain logic, the business logic, and not have to worry about these messy sort of arcane implementation details that just get in the way of understanding the correctness of your software. And then you also gain the ability of resource safety, but it's a more powerful type of resource safety because you get a construct like finally, but it operates across asynchronous regions as well and guarantees that you can clean up resources and even has facilities in there for supervising, spawning a bunch of threads and making sure that you shut those down when the life cycle of that bit of your code has terminated to make sure that you never leak other types of resources like threads. The, the fundamental building block in Zio is a data type called IO. And IO is a model of an effectful program. All it is is an immutable value. So if you have a value of type IO sitting around, it's just an immutable value. All methods on IO return new immutable values. And it describes an effectful computation that could either fail with an E or produce some A. So this allows you to look at a piece of code and know, can this code fail, and if so, how, and what type of value can it produce? And because it's a value, this program, which could fail or produce a value, is, is in fact a value, you can do all the wonderful things with it that you can do with numbers and strings and collections. It's a first-class effect, and, and it's treated in the same way and gives you all the same expressive power. Now, you have some interesting capabilities here because if you choose an error type of nothing, it means you're suddenly describing an effectful computation that cannot fail. And there are many such computations which cannot fail. For example, if you call system.nanotime, that's a method in Java that can't fail. Most constructors in Java can't fail. To allocate memory is something that can't fail unless it has some other side effect which can fail. There's a huge number of different methods in, in Java and in Scala, like all the random number generators and stuff like that, which can't fail even though they are effectful. And what Zio does is it gives you a way to talk about those and to look at them. You look at this in your code and you say, oh, this is an effect that can't fail. Not only can you use the nothing type with the error type, but you can also use it with the value type, which gives you a way of reasoning about and talking about computations that never compute a value. So if you run some bit of code like a server in a loop, then its value type could be nothing, reflecting the fact that this is not something that terminates. It's not something that ever produces a value. It could fail. Maybe your server goes down for some error reason E, but it never produces a value because it's an infinite computation. And of course, there are some computations, mostly degenerate or trivial, in which they can't fail and, and they can never terminate. Those actually turn out to be useful in, in certain cases. The concurrency model that Zio gives you is based on the fork join model. So if you've used fork join pools in Java, then you already know Zio's concurrency model. And, and how this works is you have an I.O., which again represents a program that might fail or produce a value, and you call fork on that get a, to get a new program that re represents the result of forking that. And out of that new program, you get access to a fiber. A fiber is a lightweight version of a thread, super lightweight. Except unlike a thread, you can have hundreds of thousands of these things inside your application at one time, all running concurrently. And that's an extraordinary ability for you to scale your application and deal with parallelism and concurrency without having to worry about the overhead of manually starting threads. The two main things you can do with uh, Fiber once you have it are you can uh, join it if you want the value. And that join is a non-blocking join. It's an asynchronous join, so it actually does not block any thread. There, nothing in Zeo blocks any thread for any period of time. Or if you decide you don't want the result of that computation, you can interrupt that Fiber as it's computing its result. And this is baked into the runtime. 
So you don't have to write any special code to do this. You can, you can write whatever type of code you want, and Zeo lets you instantly terminate that and stop wasting resources and clean up everything in a totally safe way. That means if you're racing 100 computations to see which one finishes first and you want that value, one of them finishes in 10 milliseconds and the other one takes two hours, then all those computations will be terminated at the 10 millisecond mark. A method like Futures first successful of has no capability to do that because it can't interrupt running computations. And even if it could, it probably couldn't do it in a safe fashion. And this notion of resource safety and lazy computation that minimizes the amount of work done is pervasive in, in Zeo. For example, if you do a bunch of things in parallel and one of them fails, it instantly terminates all the other ones because you needed that result. You don't have to think about that. You can just use these type safe APIs and they'll minimize the amount of work that gets computed at any point in time and do that in a way that is guaranteed to be resource safe. The benefits of this fiber-based concurrency model are massive scalability over native threads. It's totally non-blocking. It's automatically interruptible. It's always resource safe, and it gives you extraordinary powers of composition. For example, you have a bunch of fibers, and you want to combine them into a single fiber using, Runar mentioned, a monoid. You can actually monoidally combine fibers. You can take a bunch of fibers, you can reduce them together into a single fiber. It computes the result of, of those things. So these data structures, ev even though they, they don't necessarily use these terms from category theory in, inside the Scala doc, they nonetheless combine in extraordinarily powerful principled ways that let you reason about your software. Now let's take a look at queues. What are queues? What are some of the challenges of using them? And where are they used? Where do queues show up in real world software? So basic queue is a one-to-one -one queue where you have some producer and it's producing values. It could be reading requests off his socket and it's producing these requests and of course they have to be handled they have to be turned into responses. So you offer it into the queue and the queue stores it. And then consumer, a consumer on the other hand, it gets to take that web request from the queue and do some processing on it and then do something else, produce a response that ends up being translated back to the, the connection, the HTTP connection. So this is a basic queue and the reason why queues exist is because they act like lubrication between different components. They allow different components of your application to function at different rates. And the reason why that's a good thing is because if you didn't have that, then what would happen is because different parts of your application function at different rates, especially when you introduce latency, variable latency, like you never know how long a web request is going to take. It could return immediately. Or if Amazon is having trouble that day, it could take two hours, two minutes, who knows? So there's a lot of latency in modern business applications that cannot be eliminated. And without queues, what you have to do is you have to take your value and you have to hand it off directly to someone else who's free to take it. And then they have to take it and hand it off directly to someone who's free to take it. And so you introduce gridlock. There is, it's like a, a road, a crowded road with a bunch of cars on it and the cars are gridlocked. Like there's no space between them. So it's very, very inefficient. This guy accelerates a little bit than this one does and this one does and so forth all the way down the road. Whereas if there's more space on that road, then they can vary their own rates and there could even be accidents and that slows it down. But these guys slow down, the accidents handle, then they keep on going. Roads function much more efficiently with spacing between the cars. And those amounts of those chunks of space are in, in fact a type of queue and serve the same purpose as queues do in your business applications. Allowing things to function at different rates without bottlenecking or, or getting in each other's way and increasing overall throughput tremendously. Another type of queue is where you have a bunch of producers and they're all stuffing things into the queue and then you have maybe one consumer who's pulling stuff out of the queue and 
doing work on this. And this is very handy where you need to do stuff in a serialized way. The, c the consumption side needs to do things in a serialized way, maybe because it's dealing with state or it's writing to a single file and you, you can only write to a file from one thread. So for some reason, whatever reason it is, it needs to be able to serialize that action and so you have a, a bunch of produ producers all stuffing things in there and one consumer taking them out one at a time and doing whatever it has to do with it. Another example is, say the producer is your bottleneck and you have one producer that's pulling these things off. Maybe it's doing um, requests or who knows what it's doing. It's stuffing them in the queue, but you can parallelize the processing of this work. It's not bottlenecked on anything like a file or, or mutable state in memory. So you can massively parallelize that work. So you have a bunch of consumers all feeding from the same queue, pulling stuff out and doing that work in parallel. And obviously the last remaining case that you do sometimes see is you have a variable number of producers producing stuff and sticking it into the queue. And then you have a variable number of consumers all taking stuff out. And this, this works well in other cases where the producers, neither the producers or consumers are necessarily rate limited, but it may turn out that transiently during the course of your application, one of them slows down and the other, you still want the flexibility for the other side to be able to catch up and continue its work. Queues come in a lot of different flavors. You can have bounded queues, and typically once they reach their bound, they do something, maybe they block, maybe they say, sorry, can't handle it. You can have unbounded queues that just grow forever until you run out of memory. You can have queues that simply, once they reach their capacity, they just drop new things on the floor, and that's useful for some things. And then you can have sliding queues that you're adding a whole bunch of stuff in there, and then when you add too much, when you reach the capacity of the queue, it drops the oldest one off the queue. And that's very handy when you need to look at a window of recent data and you don't really care about the entire history of the thing. So in that case, consumers are, are more concerned with the recent stuff and it's okay for them to miss the occasional thing if, if things are going too fast, if producers are producing too quickly. There's first in, first out queues, which is the most common type of queue. There's also last in, first out. And then there's priority queues. All these have different applications and different things. But by far, the most common type of queue is a FIFO queue, first in, first out. And that's the type that you're going to see in Zio. Actors are another example of where queues are used to perform the function of a, of a mailbox. So an actor has a mailbox, and it receives messages. And then it does its own processing. Um, using perhaps local mutable state. And having that mailbox lets it take different variable amounts of time to do its work before it gets the next, before it processes the next message. And then anyone who's sending the actor messages, they don't have to wait around for the actor to, to finish its work. They can just drop it in the queue and go about their daily business. So you, so you get much more uh, responsiveness to variable latency and much more higher throughput as a result of using a queue for the actor mailbox. Concurrent graph search is, is another place where you'll see queues where graphs and other, most problems, actually almost every problem in computer science is a graph search problem, or at least can be viewed as one. But when you do a concurrent graph search, you, you pull off stuff and then you look at neighbors and then you can't keep track of all of that on the stack. So one of the common ways to handle that is to stuff it in a queue. And then, of course, if you have a concurrent queue, you can start processing stuff from many different threads, and you can achieve faster graph search and, and converge on solution to your problem more quickly. Resource sharing is another interesting place where queues show up. It's where you have uh, some sort of scarce resource, like the threads, for example. And so you stuff work in those things, and you, you take them off on the other side, and it's, it's a way of taking a pie and slicing it up into uh, a fair number of pieces and making sure everyone gets their slice of the pie. And then I al already mentioned the other major application of queues, which is you have fast producers and, and slow consumers, and queues give you that loose coupling between your system that allows you to respond to these variations. So queues are not without their problems. Obviously, they're, they're very powerful 
and they can be used to solve a lot of problems. They are used to solve a lot of problems, like they're, they're pow they power ACA and, and many other libraries out there. But they're not without their issues. And some of them are pretty gnarly, especially if you decide to use a queue inside your own application. Let's take a look at that. By far, the most popular queue out there on the JVM is a little data structure stuffed into Java Util Concurrent Blocking Queue. If queues won medals, then Blocking Queue would win the first place medal. That's how often it's used. You can find it in Kafka and Akka and Spark and Elastic, almost any. <laughs> That's not true, apparently. But you can find Blocking Queue in almost any open source project out there. And this, it's actually a very well made queue. It's very efficiently implemented. It's extremely well tested. It's been bulletproofed over the course of, I don't even know how long. It, I was working in Java before it existed, and things were quite painful. And that came along as just solved so many problems. And the API for it is actually very simple. It's kind of like what we would prefer to have a queue look like. It has, among other methods, it has two things. Take, which gives you an A out of the queue, and then offer, which puts an A into the queue. And it returns true or false based on whether or not it actually did succeed in putting that value into the queue. And it might not succeed because of the way it's been configured. The problem with this blocking queue is, well, it blocks. So it actually, every time you call take, look at the type signature of that. When you call take, and the type promises that it's going to return you an A. And the only way it can satisfy that promise is by blocking the thread, blocking the thread that you're using to call take. And so it, it does. It, it blocks that thread until someone adds an element that is available to you. There might be other, other consumers calling take all at the same time from different threads. Eventually, you'll, you'll get yours, but all these threads will end up blocking until an A is available. And there's another problem, actually, which is less obvious, but it's still implied by the type signature of the blocking queue. And that is, if you have a really fast producer that is calling offer a lot, and a slow consumer that's calling take not very often, then your queue will start growing and growing and growing and growing without bound. And that means at some point things are going to blow up unless you've designed some mechanism in there to stop that from happening. Things are going to blow up. And this, this scenario where you have different rates of production and consumption and that leading to unbounded growth of, of memory or CPU or some other resource is typically solved with something called back pressure. Back pressure lets you say, OK, we're going to look at that queue. And well, it looks like it's getting too big. We don't want to blow up our server. So maybe we're going to have to slow down our rate of production. And what's the problem with manual back pressure? Code that looks like that. And not always exactly like that. But basically, it's, hey, if if we can't stick anything in here, we've got to slow down. We've got to do something. We've got to take some strategy to deal with the fact that we're going too fast. And otherwise, we're, we're going to keep producing. And, and this is a non-composable solution to the problem. Because if we have our producer itself, maybe itself, consuming from other queues. So we've got to add manual back pressure at those points. So we've got to, we can't reason about the correctness of the entire system by reasoning about its pieces. We actually have to reason about the entire system because manual back pressure is not composable. So you don't have to use blocking queue. There's concurrent linked queue, which is, again, a really fine implementation. It's used widely. But its take method has a problem. It returns null if it's empty. Uh, obviously, it's a problem. It's null uh, if you're doing FP. But that's not the, the major problem. The major problem is that it's kind of a pain to use. 
If that method returns null, when you call it, what are you going to do? Well, you have to find something else to do with your time. So this is, is not going to have necessarily the, the same problem of blocking threads, but it's, it solves the problem of blocking threads by pushing it off onto you. You can solve this messy problem, and that's no fun. And then, of course, if you're using concurrent link queue, you still have the problem that if you have a fast producer, it could be exceeding the rate of your consumers to deal with those pieces of data. So you're going to have to incorporate manual back pressure into that. So what's the solution? Well, I'm going to argue in this talk, obviously, I'm a, a little biased, I'm going to argue that a solution that is very uh, principled and uh, very easy to use is the queue inside Zeo. So let's take a look at the API first. So not too unlike the Java blocking queue, it has take and offer methods. And the take returns a program that cannot fail and will compute an A. The offer takes an A and returns a program that cannot fail and produces unit because no information is needed. And then there is another method, or will be soon, called shutdown that shuts down the queue. I'll talk about that later. There's two ways you can construct one of these, a bounded queue, which is essentially a, it's, it's a back-pressured queue. I'll talk about what that means. And the unbounded queue, which is, is not a back-pressured queue. This is how you use it. So in this example, I create a queue that's unbounded. And then I offer the string, give me coffee, into the queue, and I call dot forever. And dot forever just takes that program. Remember, effects in Zio are first class values, so we can write combinators on them. So I have an effect that calls offer on a queue, and I want to do that, I want to repeat that effect forever in a loop. So I call dot forever. And now I have an action that repeats forever, continuously offering that string into the queue. And it took me almost no code to do that. And you look at the code and it basically, it tells you exactly the intent of the code and the semantics. And of course, I don't want to do that in the main fiber here. Otherwise, I'm never going to get to the third line. So I'm going to fork that off. That's how easy it is to, to fork that. So now it's off running in its own fiber and it's running forever. And it's not running forever with a real thread. This is a fiber. So it's not actually going to consume infinite resources. If no work is being performed, it, it stops consumption of this. And also, if I wanted, I could add combinators to clean that up. In the third line, I take something from that queue, and then I flat map that. Re remember, IO is a, is a value. So to get access to that value and do another effect, I call flat map. And then I'm just going to print that out to the console forever. So here I've created two fibers, which both go on forever. And one of them is continuously offering a string. The other one is continuously printing it out. So a very simple example of how you might use this queue. It's the hello world example of queue, where you have producer and con consumer. This is a concurrent queue. So I'm going to give you five killer features of Zio queue, and each one of them solves real-world problems that you have in your applications, or that, if you don't use queues directly, that library authors who wrote the libraries that you were using had in the libraries that they built that you use. Concurrency is, of course, not unique. Current, concurrent linked queue and concurrent blocking queue are also concurrent, but Zio queue is concurrent as well, which means you can have any number of producers and any number of consumers working from the same queue. You don't have to worry about that. And it's all, it's all going to be thread safe, or should I say fiber safe. Feature number four, and this is where we start to venture into the world where you do not have this capability in the world of procedural programming. So because Zio has 
this capability to interrupt fibers that are running at any point in time, um, you, you can actually create consumers or producers. In this case, I create a producer. And you can um, stop them, even if you don't have any explicit termin termination logic in that code. So in this case, I create that fiber that's just continuously putting in give me coffee into the queue, and I fork that off into separate fiber, and then immediately I turn around and interrupt it and say, no, I, I didn't really want to do that. I'm going to interrupt it. So this ability to interrupt any take or any offer at any time without any custom logic and without leaking any resources instantaneously is extraordinarily powerful because it allows you to perform a lot less plumbing and, and achieve much more compositional designs. Interruption is very compositional. It just threads through your entire program. Killer feature number three is clean shutdown. So this is a problem with blocking queue and link blocking queue and other types of queues. And the problem is as follows. Many times, the life cycle of a queue will be finite inside your application. It'll exist for a while, and then uh, we'll be done with that, and we need to shut it down. But there could be who knows how many threads taking stuff and offering. How do we deal with those? Well, ZOQ, because of the capability of interruption, actually can do something that other queues can't, which is if you shut down a queue, anyone who takes or offers from that queue will be interrupted. That means those fibers are terminated and all resources are safely cleaned up. And it's as easy to do that as calling queue.shutdown. It's taken care of, and you have a guarantee that whoever tries to do anything with that queue, all these out there stray fibers that were doing work before, once that queue is shut down, then they'll be terminated and safely cleaned up. Killer feature number two is that this is an asynchronous queue. What I mean by that is there's no blocking in any of these methods. They all return right away. So they all return right away, and then they'll do callbacks at some point later on. So in this case, I, I use this to my advantage. I create an unbounded queue. I take something from the queue, and I print it out, and I run that forever. So that's a worker. My worker is just going to take something from the queue and print it out. And these workers are going to run forever, at least until they're interrupted. And then I decide to spin up 10,000 of these workers. Why not? So what do I do? Well, a worker is just a value. So I can use all my value level machinery to make more workers. In fact, I, I just call list.fill, specifying I want a list that's 10,000 elements long. And then I specify the worker. Now I have 10,000 workers. This is the power of compositionality I'm re and first class effects that are ordinary values. You can't do this in less lines of code without a purely functional solution. The equivalent using Java thread, for example, would be nightmarish. And then what I do is I take these workers and um, I fork them. I fork them so they're all running off in, in that should be fork all, by the way. But um, they're all running off in 10,000 different fibers. But they're not consuming 10,000 different threads. Keep in mind that Zio is non-blocking. It means when any fiber is not actively doing work, there's no thread being consumed. So even though I have 10,000 workers here, I'm only consuming a couple of threads, and maybe not even full time. And if there's no work, if there's nothing inside this queue, then absolutely no CPU resources are being consumed. And then what I do is I, I finally offer more coffee, and I, I do that forever, and then I, I fork that. So I have one producer, and I have 10,000 consumers all pulling from that at the same time. And this is consuming them only a couple threads, and it's only consuming threads for as long as there's actually work to do. And it can all be interrupted just by calling interrupt on on these fibers. And finally, killer feature number one is, oh, oh, by the way, this feature can't be done with blocking queue. It can't. The reason for that is in the type signature. Because take has to give me an A. It can't suspend the computation. It can't suspend the thread and then resume later. It has to block until that A is available. So this is a feature that simply cannot be done if you tried to design an API that would do it, 
you would have to pass a callback in and it would return a value. And if it had a value right away, it would return the value, otherwise it would call the callback. And that's hyper A would be so cumbersome and error prone that no one would ever use it, which is why this is not done. Purely functional programming opens us up to new possibilities, new ways of writing software that we could never do before. The, the number one killer feature of ZOQ is composable back pressure. So in this case, I create a bounded queue that has capacity for 10 elements. And then I create a worker that offers that, and I, I create 10,000 of them like before. I fork them, I run them off independently, and then I take stuff from the queue. What's, what's going to happen here? Well, uh, these, these offers, these offerers, they're just putting tons and tons of stuff into um, this queue, so ordinarily they'd explode because there's only one consumer here. One consumer and 10,000 producers. Ordinarily this would explode. Uh, and even if it didn't explode, if you were using blocking queue, it would, um, you would have 10,000 <laughs> threads blocking on something, which is never a state you want to be in. However, in Zio, what happens is I've specified the capacity of the queue as 10, which means that once the capacity of the queue is reached, the calls to queue.offer will be suspended. In other words, the producers who are calling offer will stop because offer is not going to resume until there's enough entries in the queue for them to put something in. And this is a very simple feature, by the way, but it's only possible in the world of purely functional programming because I'm returning an I.O., I'm returning a program, and that program can suspend or it can return a value immediately. So this composable back pressure is something that you can't do with an ordinary queue, but in purely functional code, it becomes almost trivial to do. And what that means is that producers can produce whatever they want, and um, I, I can build my entire application from tens of queues, hundreds, thousands of queues, it doesn't matter, and everything will automatically be back pressured. I will never have any situation where producers are exceeding the capacity of consumers. I get the flexibility that I need, I get the spacing between the traffic, but also, if the producers are going way too fast, then they're automatically suspended until there's enough room in the queue. And I'm out of time here, so I'm going to wrap this up in the next three minutes so they don't drag me off the stage. Uh, I'll give you an example of using a queue to build an actor in Skull Z, or at least an actor-like thing. So an actor is nothing more than an arrow in a Kleisley category. Like Runar said this morning, he introduced Kleisley categories. Actors are arrows in a Kleisley category of I.O. in this case. And this defines an actor with a run method. You give it an A, and it's going to return an I.O. of B. And in, in this example, I create a function called makeActor that allows you to produce an actor. How does that work? Well, we create a ref to hold the state of the actor. We create a bounded queue, so we're going to get back pressure out of this automatically. And then we um, create the fiber that's going to be doing the work. The fiber takes something from the queue. It gets its state. It creates... Um, um, it, uh, it, uh, the queue actually holds, by the way, A's and promises of B's. So everything in the queue is an A. That's the input message and a promise of B, which we can complete later. And, and then it receives it. It computes the new state. It does error handling uh, using supervision and then it's going to run this forever in a loop, just continuously taking from this queue, consuming no resources if there is no work. It returns the actor then, which then just adds an entry to the queue consisting of the input message and a promise for the output message, which will then be completed by the actor when it has time to finish that. And we use it like this. We make a counter, and then we can send messages to the actor, and we can call this from any number of fibers, and it's just going to work the same way that you would expect, and we'll, we'll actually get typed responses from this style of actor, and they compose very well. So that's all we have time for today. We'll just very quickly wrap up. First off, I want to do a ZOCFC, <laughs> so a call for contributors. If you like what you've seen here, and you, you want to maybe learn some pure functional programming and contribute to a library that has the potential to really change and improve the way that a lot of business developers write software, then consider contributing to Zio. We, the project's only been around a few months, but it's growing very, very fast. We have more than 40 contributors, a lot of people using it and, and helping out. And we can always use more. 
and then I will personally, if you get stuck, will personally help you. So pick a ticket, and I will help you. We'll work on it together. We'll finish it, and we'll, we'll build something really amazing together. So if you're interested in doing that, please check out GitHub. And then, well, I guess that's it, but... <laughs> Well, I, I, I was going to say there are more slides here, but my com this computer has has died. So uh, I'll, I'll just continue. Anyway, if you if you like this type of stuff, keep in mind I'm doing um, three trainings in functional Scala. If you miss my two-day workshop here next week, I'm doing a week-long training in functional programming either in Scotland or remotely European time, and then I'll be doing one in Toronto. Not, not too far. You can also attend that remotely and then one in San Francisco. So if you want more of this stuff, then by all means, check out my training. Uh, thanks again to the organizers for having me here. I've really enjoyed being here. And thanks for being a, a great crowd of attendees who, who listened well and did not heckle. So I appreciate that despite the glitches we had getting set up. Uh, thank you very much.